Good morning, everybody. My name is Richard Dornhart. I'm the National Security Practice Manager from Data3, and welcome to our webinar today, where we'll be talking about cyber trends uh, with Interpol. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to run through a couple of brief housekeeping items, uh, just to make sure that one, um, we have an opportunity to get to questions. And what I'd like to ask you to do is, you should see a Q&A option uh, in, in the webinar, and, and please uh, take the opportunity to put your questions in there. We will hopefully have time at the end to answer some of your questions. And also, uh, the ones that we don't get to, we will make sure that we come back to everybody on the webinar with a bit of an FAQ, uh, pulling together all the questions that have been asked. Uh, the second thing is uh, just a bit of a legal disclaimer, um, being that we are talking to Interpol today. We just want to call out that uh, we won't be able to discuss any official Interpol business, uh, nor will we be able to talk about any current investigations or other member countries. So just to get a little bit of housekeeping out of the way, and let's go ahead and get started by introducing uh, who I have with me on the webinar today. And first, I'd like to introduce uh, Corinne Vermeck, who is a cybersecurity specialist from Cisco. Who, comes, who joins us with a lot of experience, and she's going to be uh, co-monitoring with me today as, as, as we talk to our very special guest, uh, Doug Ritchie. Uh, Doug is uh, a 20, oh, I'm sorry, a 30-year veteran in law enforcement and is currently uh, an assistant deputy director at Interpol. How are you today, Corinne and Doug? We very, very well, well thank you. Yeah. Awesome, great, great to have you both, both with me, and, and Doug, especially yourself, uh, you know, joining us from Singapore. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I thought b before we got started uh, into some of the questions uh, that that were actually posed prior to the event, um, I, I, Doug, maybe you could just spend a couple of minutes talking to us about what your role actually is within Interpol. Yeah, thanks. Uh, interesting question, and thanks so much for the invitation. Um, Cisco has been a valued partner of Interpol for some time now, and we're obviously keen to um, support any activities uh, that the partners have around these uh, types of discussions. Uh, look, I came into uh, cybercrime about 12 months ago with Interpol. Um, my role primarily was to establish the cyber threat response capability, which is primarily an intelligence-based capability, but more in relation to looking at that response element and how we can work with member countries, private public partners, as well as other stakeholders uh, across the industry to be able to triage threat, look at different forms of response, and then obviously look at how we can actually mitigate that threat and reduce the harm. Our mission is primarily to reduce the effect and harm of cybercrime uh, on the communities around the world. Interpol's got 196 member countries, which uh, presents some interesting issues and challenges, but we are also an, a neutral organisation, so we don't get involved in state actor uh, type of activities. Although at times um, our work and our activities, particularly around threat and, and, our, and our triage of threat, uh, may lead or point to a state actor. Um, for us, uh, I guess um, COVID-19 was an interesting uh, challenge for us. And through COVID-19, I also picked up the responsibility for global cybercrime operations for Interpol. And uh, at the end of last year, I've taken over also as the operational lead for the um, Global Financial Crime Task Force, so, which is primarily looking at the issues around the COVID scams, uh, the vaccinations, challenges around the counterfeit and issues of COVID vaccinations globally, and, uh, and business email compromise challenges, which uh, I'm sure we'll talk about sometime during today's session. So that's what I'm about, and that's what we're trying to achieve here. In Interpol, um, our cybercrime operations are based in Singapore, but we do provide a global remit. So, so yeah, and, and and quite a bit, quite a bit going on. It's interesting the commentary you have you made around COVID. You know, there's been a lot of changes that we've seen over the last 12 months, uh, not only from a cyber threat perspective, but also organizations are you know have have really had to change how they operate in many ways. I do that very, very quickly. Um, I'm, I'm really curious, you know, maybe to kick things off, if we might get a perspective on you, because it's, I, you know, I'm sure it's been a very busy 12 months, uh, but to hear, you know, what your team's seen over the last 12 months in terms of the global state of cybersecurity, what changes you've seen over the last 12 months? Yeah, that's a great question, and I know Karina and I have had uh, long uh, discussions around this, and and uh, we talked about what uh, what we uh, what we term the perfect storm, 
Uh, and really, it's, um, it's been a tsunami for cyber criminals and their activities primarily. Um, obviously, uh, setting up a cyber threat response area is not great um, as COVID starting to emerge and, and really it dictated and dominated my first four or five months in the job. And I, I still obviously a significant influence. But, you know, we're seeing governments pump trillions of dollars into the global economy to try to keep their economies buoyant. We've got uh, a digitalization of organizations as well as a, a movement out of offices to remote work locations. We still have the issues of IoT devices coming online with a, a, a plethora of different uh, uh, different activities, devices, and um, I guess perceived needs that uh, make life easier for people. But all these things together uh, present new vulnerabilities and opportunities for cyber criminals. And with a lure like COVID-19 and the fear that's been generated globally, uh, they, they've exploited it uh, significantly. And for us, um, really through the last 12 months, big focus has been on around ransomware attacks against health sectors, primarily hospitals providing um, responses, but we've also seen it on the research areas around the vaccines. Uh, we've seen a, a significant number of scams uh, around the COVID-19, whether it's um, circumventing supply chain around um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the hand wipes, um, face masks or the like, uh, as well as now with the with the vaccines, we're starting to see some activity around those. And and of late, we've uh, we've, we've uh, we're, we're sort of working with a number of member countries to sort of take some mitigation and some disruption activities around those things. But it's it's really just been a very dynamic space. Uh, we're seeing more and more uses of um, of service type um, capabilities that have been purchased in the darknet. These provide access to, um, I guess, tools for to commit crime in the virtual space. The, the issue for us then is um, we're not dealing with experienced uh, programmers or coders. We're dealing with more lay people that are starting to take advantage of those. So really, cyber cyber crimes becoming very low entry. Um, the detection rates are, are challenging to attribute to uh, targets. But we're working through with a number of strategies and really the, the focus for us has been the value of our private public partners of which Cisco is one uh, and how we can actually work with them better to be able to quickly triage, look at opportunities and then obviously work with our member countries to get them to take certain actions. So it's been it's been a very dynamic environment. Doug, it's it's amazing. Every time I hear you speak, you know, th there's so much that all of us can learn and I and I really hear you know, one of one of our biggest threats is the human need for information. Our need for information around COVID infection, information around vaccines, because that's that's what what you were saying. But I, I want to ask you a question, and and I think it's something that sits really well with all of our attendees today. Is in all of those crimes that you've seen and and that you've witnessed. Is there anything that stands out from an Australia perspective? Are we more at risk with regards to something? And and what have what have you seen out of your global view that's very very prevalent within the Australian territory? Sure, and that's a great question. I think for us, uh, you know, I was surprised actually to see some of the numbers that have been provided to us from private public partners and also. Um, st uh, stakeholders through the various discussion groups and um, and, and networks that we have. You know, like um, I, I was surprised to see from one uh, private public partner that uh, business email compromise from a targeting location, Australia is overly represented in the global scale with around about just over 20% of business email compromises um, have been attributed to Australia over the last 12 months, which um, caught me by surprise. You know, I, I actually thought it would have been a more um, um, varied targeted uh, market uh, around the globe, but Australia seems to be overrepresented at business email compromise. But I think the other challenge too is um, we don't really truly understand the extent and nature of the victims around the world. Not many people, uh, not everyone reports these crimes to police for a range of different reasons. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not even um, suggesting that um, police are great taking reports, but what we're seeing is, um, you know, we've seen threats uh, here in Singapore, you know, that have obviously been attributed to various countries. You know, I've, I've seen victim data that we've been able to glean from partners. Um, I've, I've gone to countries like Australia 
and sort of presented that victim data to them only to discover, and in one case, in Australia's case, you know, we, we were aware of 11,000 victims in Australia and uh, there was only one report made to police. So that's really quite challenging when we're trying to file, um, you know, we're, we're trying to sort of present a, a opportunity to national police services, but uh, because they have low victim numbers, it's, you know, they've got other priorities. So we're competing against the national priorities when we bring these cases to uh, various work through that that issue with them as it progresses. Doug, I, um, I wanted to circle back to something you said a few moments ago um, when you were talking about uh, ransomware. Uh, I remember during our preparation for the call, you were talking about uh, in the multiple stages of an attack. And, and I think in Australia, we, we've seen over the past 12 months some fairly, very significant ransomware attacks that have caused some, some major damage to some, some pretty high profile organizations. But I'd say that the, the number of ransomware attacks, at least that we're seeing, has, has gone down. But you were talking about the phases and, and the fact that typically sure. the, 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 the actual ransomware is the fourth or fifth stage uh, of, of, that, of that attack. Yeah, sure. We, we, we actually see um, a penetration of some description, um, getting access to systems, um, sometimes the theft of data, and then obviously the deployment of ransomware. Now, um, this means that um, the ransomware is generally a final phase, locks up the system. Obviously, the demand for a, a payment, whether it's in Bitcoin, uh, generally in Bitcoin. Um, I think the thing with ransomware is, um, and, and with any cybercrime, you know, you think that you're only dealing with one issue, but really there might be a multitude of different issues and different target vectors that have been applied. I mean, the the, 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 the nature of cybercrime is that um, once there's a penetration or an access to a data system, you know, they've got almost a free run to various aspects and issues of the organisation. And, and, and whether you're, um, whether you think that, um, you know, after one attack, you're clear, I, I think that's, um, that's a rather naive, I guess, in the current times. Um, the, the, the value of data and obviously the data that, and you think about the data that's stored in organisations, you know, they'll know your, your employee lists. They'll probably know employee data around uh, that business. It doesn't stop them in two or three years' time to start to vector in on, on critical staff that they've been able to glean from the previous penetration and obviously look at um, a further attack. So, you know, for us with ransomware, um, we're always looking at the precursories, uh, looking at, you know, how the penetration might have occurred, you know, whether it was efficient, um, efficient malware or whatever it might be, whether it was, uh, you know, the, you know, uh, an individual that actually hit, you know, that link in the email that they possibly shouldn't have that given, uh, gave them that access. And I think now too, with the remote workforce and people working from home because of lockdown and the like, the new vulnerabilities in the home environment. And, you know, we all had a bit of a giggle last week when uh, a lawyer had the cat meme um, stuck on his uh, Zoom call whilst he was talking to some judge, funny, but you know, if your kids are using the systems that are also keep connecting to a corporation, there's potential additional vulnerabilities there that you might not even be aware of or have control of, because uh, you know the, your, your child or, or another relative may have looked at something, clicked the link, and you might be compromised, and you might be feeding that back into your corporate system. So it's a real, real dynamic environment for organisations now to think about the issues around um, the threats and the vulnerabilities they do have with the remote workforce. Uh, and, and they really need to consider that, um, that span of responsibility to extending out to ultimately the homes of the individuals that work within that agency. So, you know, we really sort of try to think about how those vulnerabilities present themselves, how we can actually mitigate those threats and how we can actually work through um, some remediation. Um, it's been rapid change for everyone. Um, a lot of organisations, as you said earlier, have you know have been digitalising and, and changing their work practices and processes. You know the challenge with changing work practices to accommodate in a crisis is you have a tendency to cut corners too. So, you know, really from a, a cyber security um, people within the uh, these organisations, you've got to think about you know what's happened, how it might have happened, uh, and what might may present uh, as a risk or threat into the future. As far as the business email compromise 
um, that that you talked about. Now, I thought this was really interesting because, you know, we hear off. You know, you like to think that cyber criminals are doing, you know, thinking about new and innovative ways to compromise organizations. But for some reason, the email continues to uh, be the number one vector for uh, attack. Uh, and you mentioned that we're disp disproportionately um, kind of attacked with those types of, um, you know, I guess, spam. Do you have any particular guidelines based on your experience, anything that you've seen, um, or things that organizations are overlooking uh, that might, you know, might you know, we could take away from today? Well, look, um, you know, I think there's a tendency to trust email to some extent, uh, particularly from people that you think that you're communicating with, and, you know, and, and you're probably not looking for the, the dot out of place or the, or the extra character in, in a email address, whatever it might be. You just assume, oh, that's probably just a glitch or that's something wrong. And, and, and you explain the why and you get on with business. Um, I think, you know what we've seen with BEC, it's 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 a prevalent threat. We released a a public awareness campaign, the primary target of business email compromise last year, and we'll continue to raise the awareness of this threat um, because it is quite damaging. You know, I was you know I was out diving last weekend with a guy, and and he was saying that they got caught up in a you know a, quite a significant uh, business email compromise to the tune of six figures. And uh, and uh, they were able to, by sheer fluke, the insurance return that uh, that that payment to them. Uh, but you know, I think that's going to be a thing of the past if it becomes more and more prevalent. So, for us, um, you know, it's it's about uh, sort of trying to get people to think about all these transactions and processes. You know, if, if people are changing accounts, I'd be picking up a phone, and having a telephone call. Not to say that can't be uh, spoofed or in, in, uh, incorporated into some other process or practice, but um, we, we have to be. Uh, we have to just um, think carefully about these issues, particularly when it's dealing with um, significant financial transactions and the movement of money. But um, it's it's an ongoing ch challenge, an ongoing threat. Uh, it will continue um, to continue. I think you know we're seeing a lot of BEC that's stemming out of Africa. Um, you know they are um, they are persistent. I think it's the word. Not necessarily sophisticated. You know, we're seeing some sophisticated attacks from other parts of the world, but a lot of these BEC attacks out of Africa are, are persistent uh, and, 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 and they'll get knocked back, but they'll continue looking at various vectors to try to ex, uh, exploit an opportunity. So, you know, just be conscious of those risks and threats. It's, um, it's a challenging environment. Doug, somebody once said to me that as a defender, we have to be right every time. As an attacker, you only have to be right once. So those persistent attacks really, really do become quite, quite a headache. Richard, when we when we look at what Cisco also sees, similar to the trends that that Doug have just spoken to, business email compromise is a big concern. It is for this current you know, economic environment, it is rather concerning because it is unfortunately, as you are well aware in your own discipline as practice lead, you know, something that's not only covered by technology. So we we have to look at technology that is full fledged, gray mail, spam mail, looking at all of these kind of filters intuitively built into the technology. But also we have to look at user awareness. Um, and I think that's that's a big part to things that we need to address collaboratively um, to fight cybercrime. Yeah, I couldn't couldn't agree more. And, uh, and we're certainly seeing it uh, with the customers that we deal with on on a very regular basis. And it's just amazing to me that it's still the you know email's been around for so long, and it's still the number one vector um, for that, that criminals are using. Um, I wanted to. You know, again, go back to when we were talking a couple of days ago, Doug. You, you were talking about some of the reasons why we've seen increases in 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 overall cyber cyber activity. Some of the things that I thought were interesting that you're talking about was, you know, like you mentioned access to water and things. That I mean, these are things that I hadn't really contemplated in terms of why are we seeing more people um, take you know take to this type of activity. Sure. I mean, we, we've obviously got an organised crime element that uh, sits behind organised yeah. um, cyber crime, um, and and they're going to be, um, you know, it's it's a business for them, which is you know quite tragic. Um, 
but there's other people that are, uh, that sort of come into the crime out of necessity. Um, you know, we're seeing unemployment. I mean, if you're a, if if you've worked in airlines, uh, you know, the last twelve months hasn't been great for you. Uh, just for an ex as an example, I'm not saying they're um, jumping on board with the, uh, the the low level cyber crime, but particularly with the um, the cyber for service type activities, you know, we're seeing um, we're seeing you know a lot of uh, people out of necessity actually turning to cyber crime, and I think that's that's uh, significant um, in in relation to the fact that it just puts out new users and as uh, Corinne mentioned earlier you know they only have to get lucky once but you know if they pump out a million uh, you know phishing emails or you know some other type of activity and they get uh, you know they get half a dozen hits they're starting to make an income so it's 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 a real challenge and issue for us uh, you know we, we are identifying um, a lot of low-level players as part of our activities uh, we, we found them out to um, a lot of the, uh, the nation states for follow up and, and you know obviously for them to go and have a chat to them. You know, at the moment, it's it's very challenging, particularly with COVID. You know, um, police are prioritising their work. Uh, they've got a, a health responsibility and response that they have to do in each of the countries. So these these targets are sitting there waiting for um, you know to be actioned. But um, you know, ideally, we'd like them actioned as quickly as possible. But um, you know, it's it's really comes down to the local priorities for each of these countries. You know, we've seen um, you know significant romance scams, people being exploited just you know because they thought they were in love. And uh, you know, to, you know, we've had uh, we've had victims out to the tens of millions of dollars, um, and you know that have been extorted, uh, but basically removed from a company under the belief that they were doing the right thing, uh, or do, you know that everything was going to be okay. So it's 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 quite prevalent. Uh, people are taking advantage of a lot of opportunity, and and their market sector um, is significant in a global environment. You know, we talked about um, you know what cyber crime, uh, the cost of cyber crime is to a global economy. You know, if it, depending on which study you look at and uh, which assessment and evaluations you are, it, it, it's in the trillions of dollars. You know. One one um, think tanks estimated around about six trillion, uh, and forecasting it to extend out to about ten and a half trillion by 2025. You know that's that's horrific. You know when you think that uh, you know the drug trade globally is around about a trillion dollars. So you know people are getting hurt. People are people are losing everything, uh, and and I guess the money that has been generated out of these types of activities uh, are um, are being, it's 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 it's, it's just astronomical. You know, we, we, every man, woman, and child that walks this planet it works out to around about $765 US per year. Now, when you think a lot of countries don't earn that as an annual salary in a year, uh, you know, at some point in time, we have to look at how we respond to this. And, and it's a global issue. We need a global response. You know, we've got a lot of countries doing some fantastic stuff. But they're limited to their national borders, and 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 I guess by extension sometimes to an extraterritorial requirement if it impacts on their citizens. But um, okay, it's not going to really cut it at times when we've got people that uh, know where safe havens are, uh, hide in those safe havens so they can't be touched. Um, you know, we, we've got others that um, you know they just flout the law, knowing that it's going to be difficult for law enforcement or anyone else to be able to touch them. And I think we, we've actually got to think about, and, and, and by nature, um, the national uh, legislative frameworks of all these different countries do provide levels of protection for these uh, these offenders as well. So we, we, we've got to think a lot more strategically globally on how we can actually tackle this uh, this challenge. And I know our Secretary General's labelled as uh, as you know the cyber pandemic, and and really is uh, is really exacerbated with COVID nineteen. So it's interesting, cyber pan pandemic, that's a really interesting way of, uh, of uh, positioning it. Sorry, Karen, over to you. Doug, I, I wanted to add on, and Richard, you may or may not be aware, in, in a previous life, you know, I, I worked quite closely with Interpol in terms of the maturity of legislation, because that's a, that's a really important part. And I think that's something that Doug just touched on, the reality that in, in countries like Australia, there are there are task forces that looks at frameworks and giving guidelines and, and developing support for the country. But in many countries, they haven't adopted legislation around cybercrime as yet. 
And that effectively makes that a safe haven because the local law enforcement doesn't have a mechanism under which they can prosecute. And, and this becomes critical. Again, that's something that I think Doug will attest to is an absolute headache in Africa. Um, and, and a lot of developing countries are battling with that adoption of, of the criminality around computer-driven crime. Um, and saying that as you know, simplistic as I can, that in itself is, is one of the big battles that we have to fight globally. It's a, it's a really interesting point. It kind of brings me to my next question. And Doug, you were talking about you know, how uh, local, state, federal, and international police forces and organizations are working together to try to combat this problem. I guess I'd maybe be interested to just get a perspective from you on, we've got a lot of different organizations on the call today. Um, you know, how, how can a private organization join, you know, what types of, you know, and, and support local and, and, and kind of international law enforcement? Yeah, look, it's a good question. And I, I should stress that I don't think law enforcement is the, um, the, the only solution to the problem, uh, which, is, which is important. You know, we're into a response phase primarily. You know, we get a bit of a sniff that there's a bad guy and we'll go and grab the bad guy. You know, that's one way of responding to it. But there's other ways of obviously disrupting this type of activity. And, you know, we're working with industry at the moment around preventative operations. Um, you know, we're looking at misconfigured servers globally, how we can reconfigure them so it prevents DDoS attacks, for example. You know, we're scanning uh, health um, facilities around the world to be able to identify vulnerabilities that can be exploited by cyber criminals and we're letting them know so they can actually get them back up to speed. You know, a lot of that work's also provided by private industry, which is fantastic. For us, you know, I, I can't do my job without uh, Gateway Partners, uh, of which Cisco is one. Um, we, we're obviously looking and we're, we're getting quite a few offers to partner with a whole range of different industry groups. Uh, I think we need that. Uh, the problem, uh, that, that, that there's still a lead time for me to get pro uh, partners on board, which presents some challenges. I think um, we need to start to share threat information a lot more readily across a whole range of different vectors. You know, um, you know the certs as well as uh, as well as law enforcement as well as others. We need to um, establish an environment where we actually can communicate and talk to people um, fairly quickly. Uh, time is sometimes of the essence. Uh, the other night. Um, you know, for example, the threat team here monitored some discussion in a, in a, in a dark web channel. Uh, it came through um, in assistance with one of the private public partners. But you know, it was it was the preparation for a ransomware deployment on a, on a significant um, industry player. You know, so we were able to go out and try to get onto the front foot in relation to that attack, and and obviously engage with local law enforcement because that's where we are positioned. You know, we hope in future that um, we might be able to triage these types of threats with a broader select, selection of groups outside of our gateway partners and law enforcement, you know, potentially to include the, the certs and agencies like um, you know, the computer emergency response team. So for us, it's, um, it's, it's about working with a broad cross section of the community. Um, it's about um, understanding the threat. It's about trying to look at every opportunity to attribute, uh, to see what we can do to prevent it, as well as obviously disrupt uh, the, the threat actors that sit behind it. Um, you know, locally, you know, cyber crime is a human crime. You know, it's committed by people. Um, uh, you know, I think, um, I think, you know, over the history of and the emergence of cyber crime, and, and dare I say it, I've seen it in my career, which is really tragic in one respect. But, um, you know, um, when, when it started, everyone, everyone looked at the technical issues around cyber and and they were a bit too hard. And, you know, people buried their heads in relation to the technical issues because they didn't understand them. And, and, and I think over time, you know, they've still worked on the technical issues, but they're starting to look at the human factors around the crime type. And, you know, there's some really great work that's been done by a range of different academics around, you know, what to look for. You know, the, the challenges and issues we see in, in the virtual environment applies to the criminal network. You know, we're starting to get a lot more proactive in, in identifying their business practice vulnerabilities and looking at how we can exploit those vulnerabilities to be able to access information. Classic example of late, you know, um, one of the private public partners that we work with um, identified an issue around um, 
this this malware that was going out, but that the the threat actor actually used the malware on himself to test it, and as a result, he left a vulnerability open that we were able to exploit and identify the threat actor. Great for us, but you know also some of these um, threat actors that do coding, you know like um, you know we you know a lot of us use Microsoft or whatever else they use, but you know you get the regular patches for issues that have been identified. You know, similar to the coding that's been used for exploitation as well. So, you know, we have to be a lot more proactive in relation to how we do our business. We have to be a lot more creative in how we actually look at how we disrupt and attribute. And we're working fairly closely with a range of different partners that provide us a lot of opportunities to, you know, do some things differently to be able to get the outcomes we need. So, that's, and we'll continue to do that. Doug, I think that that's a tremendous segue into into one of, one of our other discussion points. But but before I venture down that, when you started, you said something that really stuck with me. You know, one of Interpol's key mandates um, is to reduce the effect of harm, and that's something as defenders across everything that we sometimes forget is that harm element. And you also mentioned the fact that because people don't report it as private citizens to their local law enforcement, it really becomes hard to stress the importance of it. Um, and I, I do think I can, I can absolutely reiterate that as private sector, you know, doing the basics around reporting it when you have fallen victim to this. But something that we want to discuss with you is a lot of countries have come up with a sort of a framework or some guidance. And here in Australia, we're seeing a big drive behind what is called the essential eight. And that really ties up very nicely with things that you've said under, under the prevent attack and essential eight, they talk about patchwork and the importance of patchwork. And under the ambit of limit the extent of attack, you know, they talk about the importance of things like multi-factor authentication. And I want to, you know, I want to use you a bit as a soundboard and ask you, what, what is your opinion around, around these kind of frameworks and, and how they give guidance to industry as to how do they better protect themselves? Oh, I think they're, they're, they're very valuable frameworks. I think um, just having people thinking about the issues and challenges, risks and threats, I think is a, a very good thing. The fact that, uh, you know, things have been articulated to share, I think, are important. Um, you know, it's, it's a challenge for industry in one respect because, you know, you get frustrated with, you know, multi multi-factored um, verifications, you know, when you're trying to do something that's, oh, this used to be simple, you know, but obviously the security issues sometimes are, I guess, a hard sell to a customer base in some respects because, hey, you know, we're human. We like things easy. But, uh, you know, like, I think, um, I think the frameworks are, are very valuable. We, we do look at um, a lot of the frameworks that come through. We are actively involved in a range of different discussions. Uh, I, it's, it's, it's actually a privilege to work at Interpol due to the access that we do have to, you know, discussions around the World Economic Forum, the United Nations uh, and, and the like. Um, we, we are very, very keen to sort of uh, expand, I guess, our activities with partners uh, and, and actually look at how we can actually leverage off a range of different opportunities that some of these frameworks um, have flagged or identified and, and, and looked at that. But really, you know, for us, it's, it's, about, um, it's about, you know, together we make a difference. Uh, and I think that's the vital issue. I think, you know, police historically have been very, um, you know, they like to keep things to themselves. It's police business. Uh, you know, we're, we're not great sharers. Um, we, we, we like to collect information. I, I'm, I'm speaking from my personal perspective. I don't want to sort of uh, impugn any, any national law enforcement. That's uh, not what I'm here for. But, um, you know, like, um, you know, I know in my career, you know, like, you know, you share certain information, you know. And, and, and when I came into the Interpol role, you know, I saw with the um, private public partners quite a transactional relationship. Um, you know, we put a request for information. It went out to the private public partners. They assessed it, evaluated, and they responded to that. And I sort of looked at that process, and I just thought, this is just not going to work. Um, I mean, it, it, it delays everything by weeks and months. Uh, so, you know, we, we now work collegiately. You know, we've got an office here in Singapore. Yep, it's locked down at the moment. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've got private public partners that actually sit with us. 
we have this beautiful wall between the, uh, the private public partners and our operational staff. That wall's gone. Um, so we're all working on the room and discussing these things. We have a, a you know a, a fortnightly meeting with all our partners uh, to discuss threat, uh, work through the threats. Uh, you know I've had so many conversations over the last twelve months with uh, partners, and I sit down with them and start talking to them about some of the threats that we're seeing, and you know they start saying, oh we're working on that, and you know it's just about trying to join up these dots and and trying to get these things in place. You know, I'm seeing some really impressive stuff coming out from a range of different sectors, uh, groups. You know, Europe is, is, is a driving force in relation to some of these issues around uh, process and frameworks. Australia is doing some interesting stuff, um, particularly around uh, some of their new legislation to combat the cyber threat. Um, and, and, and we'll continue to work with all those stakeholders and partners to try to try to leverage off that and try to look at how we can actually uh, incorporate that into our business models and operational uh, activities. So that's what we try to do. It's a, it's a, it's a continuing, dynamic, ever-changing type of environment. Doug, it's a, it's a good segue into one of the questions that has come through in the, in, in the Q&A. Um, someone's asking about how, inter, you know, do you have any influence? Do you, do you work with like, let's, like organizations like the Australian Federal Government in terms of policy? Um, is there a consultative process? Uh, how, how does that does that happen? Uh, look, um, we have um, we have the cyber ambassador and a number of key um, members from Australia that are part of our, um, our expert working group. Uh, so that they uh, participate in a lot of discussions and issues. I mean, from a policy perspective, um, I mean. We primarily service the law enforcement industry. You know, the 194 member countries primarily uh, affected through that national law enforcement um, arm. And, and under our charter, we primarily service those types of issues. So for government policy, um, we, we, we can provide advice, we can provide guidance, but we don't participate in that policy development per se. Um, it's, uh, you know, and from my perspective, I'm very much operational. Um, we are. Uh, you know, my, my job is to improve the operational outcomes globally around the cybercrime threat. Uh, you know, I spend uh, some time talking to partners and talking about some of the issues like we're doing today. Um, but my primary focus is to look at how we can actually, um, you know, get more bodies into cold cells, warm bodies into cold cells is a common catch cry of mine. But also um, look at how we can actually disrupt uh, some of the activity. So, you know, although I do a lot of responsive work, I also have this preventative piece that we're we're trying to marry up as well. Yeah. And, and you know, we're very pleased to um, you know be working with a number of key partners to look at these uh, misconfigured servers. It's something that's been tried many many times before. We're hoping that we can actually get a, a bit more impetus into this initiative. We've got two pilot countries now that are working through those challenges with uh, two of our partners. Um, and, and we're hoping to be able to extend that to a global response. So my, my, my job is really the operational piece. At the end of the day, um, you know, a lot of people will develop policy. Um, we hope to influence that to policy at the international level through the United Nations and World Economic Forum. We're well represented there. Um, Craig Jones, the director of cybercrime here at Interpol, is actively involved in those types of activities. My job is just to see if I can um, get some bad guys. That's ultimately what it is. So. Do you have another question here just around the perspective from uh, cyber awareness? Obviously, something that's really important. Um, kind of interested just to get your, your take on that. I think the, the comment here is that, uh, let's see if I can find it again real quick. Uh, one of the biggest disruptions is education and awareness. So um, I'm sure you, know, you, you obviously do a lot in that space. Any, any thoughts uh, around that? And, types of strategies organizations could be uh, bringing on? I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something, you know, like the hardest thing, uh, I think in education and awareness, and, and, and it's, it's a big effort, effort and it's a big lift for organizations to really contemplate and consider. It's actually trying to ingrain practices into the culture of the organization, you know, and it's actually trying to get people to think about the issues, the threats, and it, it, it comes almost second nature. Um, you know, look, um, it's hard in organisations when there's an identified insider threat, it happens. It's a significant threat to organisations. You know, how do you, how do you encourage people to report an, a potential insider threat 
you know, that's hard. It's dealing with people. But it's about building cultures around professionalism and, and awareness and, and capabilities as well as, uh, as well as, you know, just some simplistic rules, building it in so it becomes actually second nature to all your employees. And, you know, organisations are extremely dynamic. I mean, they're changing. You've got a rotation of staff. You always got to have a consistent flow in relation to those things. And I think for organisations, it can be quite frustrating that, you know, you're repetitive and trying to repeat your message and you're trying to look at different ways to really try to advise, guide and, and, and instruct or direct uh, your personnel. So it's it's not an easy task in relation to capability and, 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 and capacity development. So for us, um, you know, look, we, we've got a capability and capacity area. Look, we're primarily focused on law enforcement. Uh, you know, we, we try to educate police around these issues. Um, for us, it's, uh, you know, a very different framework for organisations. But for organisations, it's it's a it's a tough call, particularly when you you know, you know, they do look at the bottom line, and uh, you know it, there is a cost in relation to that. But I have to stress, you know, like you look at some of the organisations in Australia over the last twelve months that have been hit with a ransomware or or some other attack. Um, you know, the costs are significant uh, for a, a vulnerability breach uh, or, or or a compromise uh, in that environment. Not only up to the bottom line, but also potentially to, this, um, to, to the future bottom line, as well as reputation, a whole range of other activities. And I think these are some of the challenges for organisations. You know, you know, why report a breach when I'm going to have the Privacy Commissioner knocking on my door or I haven't been able to protect the data of people? And I think, um, I think as a community, you know, we've had some big data breaches over the last 10 years, you know, and, you know, the issues around... Um, um, uh, Cambridge Analytica and, and all those use of data. I think people are almost becoming desensitised to the fact that my data's out there and it's going to be used by someone or someone's going to try to hack. And I think that that's, you know, sad that we've gotten to this point. But, you know, I think um, I think organisations need to sort of think about um, biting the bullet and actually sharing the problem because there may be a solution out there that if they, if, if they share the problem, uh, they might be able to get a resolution. And I'll talk about a, a case, recent case. I want no names, no pack drill. Company attacked, ransomware, uh, pretty much locked up. Um, again, I'm out having a quiet dinner one day. I hear about this attack. I go back to the office. I sit down with the guys. We have a bit of a chat about the threat. Oh, we've got a decryption key on that one. Yeah. If they had contacted us, we would have been able to resolve the issue through some partners. Now, you know, it's it's just about sharing that problem. And, uh, and you know, the three or four weeks heartache that organisation had could have been resolved in an hour. Um, so, you know, um, and, and that's quite challenging, quite funny from some. Uh, but there's a lot of fantastic people working across industry. There's a lot of fantastic people working across a range of different, um, uh, different capabilities uh, that, are, that are, you know, on the side of good. And they're working through the risks, threats, and issues. There's always stuff emerging quite regularly that can solve or assist in uh, remediating these types of threats. So, unless you ask and share your problem, you're going to have some problems. You, you know, you, you, you'll never know what's out there sometimes. It's uh, very good points. And I've, I've just got a number of questions flowing through, Corinne. So, I'm just going to try to get to a few of them. Uh, That's uh, perfect. Uh, That's perfect. Let's try and answer as much as we can. Um, it, and I think it, you know, it, it's very topical in, the, uh, in terms of information sharing, Doug. And you know, is there? Um, how do we get to? Is information shared in real time? How do we get to something like that? Like you mentioned just a moment ago, uh, if if the if the organization would have reached out or would have, you know, we had the decryption key. How does that? How does that? How do we fix that? What? What? In your opinion. Uh, what what could we do to share information better? And because cyber happens in real time, right? These these challenges. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think what we're seeing is um, we, 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 we're, our information sharing is improving quite quickly uh, with national law enforcement. Uh, and I know um, I know Australia has uh, has tied up all the state polices, so there's a national response to issues around cyber, and there's a range of different operations that canvas. 
across the area, as well as other government agencies like um, Australian Border Force and the like. So there's an integration of all the capabilities that may potentially respond to a cyber, cyber crime event in Australia. And I'll, I'll just use Australia as an example, which is fantastic. So, you know, they're starting to see a threat. You know, there's na a National Crime Bureau, which is an Interpol desk, as well as a Europol desk in, in, in Australia. You know, they, they, they pump out the, the issues. Uh, it, it, it goes out into, it comes into our systems through our I-24 system or into Europol systems through Siena. Whatever it is, they're sharing the problem. And then what's happening is we're starting to look at similar issues that might be seen in other parts of the world. So, you know, my threat response team gets these, you know, daily. You know, we're getting them constantly and from all various different countries. And then we start to sort of triage those types of issues with private public partners to look at a, a, the type of response or, or the advice that we can provide back to the member countries. Um, I think, you know, we're getting to the point where a country can't do this on its own. You know, we, we you know, the the complexities of these types of crimes, you know, that they'll be funneling, you know, they'll be using infrastructure across, you know, third party countries, you know, they'll be running money and, 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 and you know, the, the laundering money back through a whole range of third part, uh, different third party countries. They'll be sitting in one country, but they'll be quite detached from everything else that's there. So, you know, we, we need to sort of actually start to work a lot more collegiately, a lot closer in relation to those. Now, countries can pump out resources into all these partner countries to develop these bilateral relationships. They're going to be doing a lot of effort to try to get outcomes in relation to those activities where, you know, an organisation like Interpol has the, has the ability to be able to at least share information, start to talk about the problem and try to look at solutions um, relatively quickly. So, you know, we, 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 do, we do work with a range of different partners. We do see some really cool stuff when it's flagged with us. You know, we, we're quite quick at testing it, validating it, cross-referencing it to make, you know, to ensure that what we're dealing with is correct. Uh, but, uh, you know, we do have um, some positive successes. We work with our regional poles like Europol, Afropol, Asiana Pol, um, and, and we do work with these regional poles and other, uh, other, other groups um, constantly uh, to try to sort of mitigate some of the threats and risks that we're seeing. So, you know, really it is together we can make a difference for an organisation. Look, it, it's, it's a business decision for organisations at the end of the day. I get it. You know, you've just got to look at the risks and the value proposition in relation to those. And sometimes you might have to bite the bullet, in all honesty, but you've got to obviously make that decision based on the circumstances and the issues and the risks and threats that you're actually seeing from an organisational perspective. I get it, but, uh, you know, we've got to change how we respond to this. Uh, you know, if hit stuff's hitting my desk, we're not going to talk about it. You know, we're not going to share it. You know, if we go to the media, we make sure everyone's happy for us to go to the media. We, but you know we, we're not the type of organisation that that, um, that that will share information publicly uh, because it's just not the right thing to do. And, and you know when you think about it too, you know I've got the United States, Russia, China, Iran, Australia, all Europe. I've got all these countries as member countries. Now sometimes they don't want me to share their information with other countries, and we can manage that. Okay. I'm a neutral organisation. I work for a neutral organisation as in Interpol. Uh, we try to do the best to catch bad guys. That's what our job is. Uh, but we also have to be very conscious of the fact that people share information with us confidentially, and we have to preserve that confidentiality. Doug, I think it's such amazing yes. feedback that you're giving us. But what, what I'm also hearing you say is that that information sharing starts with local law enforcement. And, and because of your mandate, you know, it's it's how we weigh off and i think that's that's rather important that organizations realize that that disclosing that to local law enforcement doesn't necessarily always bring the bad media element if mm -hmm. you know everything is done confidentially but it is rather important that you cooperate because as you mentioned now you know everybody else can learn out of that and you you might already have the countermeasure for that specific attack um, circumventing a lot of a, a lot of teary eyes and a lot of war room nightmares in in a organisation. Um, Richard, do you have another question for us before before we start wrapping up? Yeah, I, I do have another um, here. It, it starts off uh, with the solar winds attack, but I'm not going to ask you to get into any detail around the solar winds attack, Doug. But uh, 
uh, it's kind of stating that you know attacks can come from anywhere at any time and uh, with greater reliance on third parties, which is you know more and more we're seeing the integration of multiple third parties in order for us to be able to do business and cloud providers. Uh, do you have any advice uh, around screening these providers, uh, contract protection, those types of things? Just w what's your take on, on cloud and how to protect ourselves? Look, um, really great question. Really great question. I mean, I guess solar winds take it up um, a lot of the community's discussions over the last six weeks or so. And, and I've been dragged into a multitude of different discussions in the Middle East and various countries around the impacts of solar winds and and you know the roles and functions and responsibilities in relation to that. Look, third parties, you know, how are you going to validate and check, you know, the, 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 the you know, the, the, if there's any vulnerabilities, gaps, or issues with code from a third party? It's tough. It's a real hardcore question, and it's and it's really difficult to try to um, think about how you actually deal that. Now, look, I'm not a, a, a complex engineer in relation to this, uh, these types of activities, but you know, like um, you have to think um, what's leaving your organisation and, and how you can monitor that information leaving it. You know, like I think, um, you know, the days of plug and play and just accepting everything's going to be working all right uh, is probably good. Who knows what vulnerabilities, backdoors, and the like uh, exist within third-party code for a plug? You know, as a plug-and-play type of method, um, strategy. I think you know you you got to be you got to be diligent, conscious of the of the potential threat and risk. You know, you got to put me mechanisms in place just to monitor, track, and see um, if everything's working to your standards and ideas. You know, from from my perspective, it, it is uh, you know. For an organisation, it, it, it is a challenge, and you just have to be on the ball and and just don't accept everything on face value. You know, just to validate it, check it. I mean, obviously, in a commercial perspective and going into contracts in relation to those types of issues, think about those. I'm sure you know the lawyers will be able to put in certain mechanisms and remediations in relation to those contract activities. But for us, um, you know, um, you know, solar winds is 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 a significant issue, and uh, and it has. Uh, broad and, and, and wide ranging um, challenges for all of us uh, collectively. Um, so it'll be interesting to see uh, how that plays up in the longer term. So the saga will continue for a little while, I'm sure. It, it, it certainly is. I think it, it caught a number of us off guard and it really got us all thinking very differently about how we interact with our third parties and, and, and to your point, you know, how we really work with them to understand their cybersecurity controls. I can tell you that I spend at least one or two days a month, if not every other week, actually answering information from our customers where they're asking us about our cyber controls. And it's, you know, there's a there's a lot of that due diligence going on, and, and I think that's a really strong, uh, it's a really good approach. But and there's certainly a lot more that we that we can do. So. We are coming to the top of the hour, um, and I think I, you know, I'd like to ask one final question of both yourself and, and Corinne, which is uh, one key takeaway. So, if if there was one thing you'd like to see people do better, or something that you want to leave and make sure everybody remembers, Doug, I'd love to get your thoughts on that, and then Corinne, I'll throw over to you. Oh, look, for me, it's um, you know, I'm, I'm share your problem, um, talk it through. I mean. Organisations like Cisco are, are great to sort of do some preliminary triage, look at issues, you know, exploit every opportunity you can to extend uh, extend the challenge and issue that you have with uh, with with your partners and, and and with your colleagues. I mean, for us, um, you know, um, I can't do this uh, role without the, the the significant support and partnership that we do have with a, a range of different stakeholders, primarily our gateway partners, which Cisco is one, but also um, but also with um, you know the the support uh, and uh, and the um, the availability of resourcing through our member countries. Um, you know it's 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 a really tough and dynamic environment. I think um, you know we, we've got some challenges still ahead um, when you think that. Uh, you know, 75 million IoT devices, or 75 billion IoT devices by 2025 connected to the uh, virtual environment. I think that's uh, whew, that just presents a whole range of new challenges, risks, and threats, and uh, and and that impacts on organisations. I mean, everyone that's connected to the virtual environment 
um, is is uh, is vulnerable, and and they need to be thinking about uh, their um, cyber security uh, architecture, uh, their processes and procedures, uh, um, how they can educate their people uh, to do these things. But you know, sharing that problem together, you know, because collectively we can potentially do something that can remediate these issues. And if worst case happens, uh, we can actually um, determine potentially uh, at least a response uh, that may assist and uh, overcome some of the immediate challenges. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to tie onto that and say I think it is agreed between the three parties on the call today that um, education is very critical and education with a mindset of changing the cultural and, you know, removing some of these entry points to um, securing every every person within your organization. But around that, I do also think if I were to give Richard and the ask is what is one, one piece of information, I think organizations should take a keen look at how they establish identity. And that's really, you know, um, the critical part as to how do we verify who's on our network? Because that doesn't only address the point of attacks and ransomware, but it also carves out very neatly, how do we respond in this future world of IoT? Is that a bot? Is that a device? Or is that a person that is sanctioned to action certain applications? So I don't think I can I can stress education and a rethink of how we establish identity more in my answer. And I think that's a, a you know a really good point. Uh, education and identity are you know particularly as we move to a cloud first environment. Uh, you know, I would add to, to all of that is just understanding our information. Doug, you talked about it earlier. Um, once we understand who's on our network, let's understand how, what information is there and who has access to it. Uh, because at the end of the day, that's what in many cases a threat actor is actually after, right? That's the gold. So understanding where your crown jewels are, wrapping the right security controls around those, and, uh, you know, having a very strong cybersecurity strategy and policy. Uh, right. So that does bring us uh, to the end of end of the hour. Um, first, to everybody that's joined, thank you very much. Uh, we have a number of questions that we couldn't get to, uh, but I will follow up with Doug, uh, Corinne, and we will take a crack at answering those uh, and coming back to you. Uh, Doug, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to um, spend the hour with us. It was extremely informative. Richard, Corinne, it's been an absolute pleasure as always, and. Uh... And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak here today. Thank you, Doug, and, and also Thank you, Doug. Corinne, to yourself for, 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 uh, and to Cisco for helping to organize this. It's been uh, a, a fantastic hour. And uh, I just want to leave again by thanking everybody. Um, please be on the lookout for additional um, sessions like this, uh, you know, thought leadership from Data3. Uh, we'll be launching a new webinar series called uh, the Spotlight Series, where we'll be you know, running events like this uh, a range of key topics, things like women in technology, technology intelligence solutions, and other areas. So uh, you can go to our website, uh, data3.com slash events, and you'll be able to see what's happening. And we'll also let you know via our ADMs and other invites. So to everybody, thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day uh, and a great rest of the week. Thank you. <laughs>